All right, we're in Daniel chapter number 3, and you're probably thinking, yeah, let's get to Daniel chapter 3 and, and get on with this thing, right? You know, the book of Daniel is a book of prophecy. It's filled with dreams and day visions and discourses. If you look at the New Testament, you will find in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus called Daniel a prophet in verse 15. Oh, and by the way, G.T. asked me to say that he did a good job last week. And so, G.T., you did a good job. I want you to know that. And he, he said, Rocky, I want you to tell him that I did a good job. And I said, I'll do that, G.T. And so, but I thought he really did a good job. I, it was a blessing to me. I sat back there last week, and I listened to the music, and I watched the kids play and, and do what they do. And I said, man, it's nice back here. <laughs> the music was just right. It, nothing was overly loud. It was just it was just right. I thought, man, this is nice sitting back here, uh, sitting back here and enjoying the, the scenes from Heritage Baptist Church. It was an unusual experience. I hadn't sat with Donna. I can't even remember the last time I sat with my wife in church. It's been, it's been, a, it's been a long time. She tried to hold my hand, and, and I was glad for that. And, uh, but it is good to be. All right, Daniel chapter 3, here we go. You know, if you look at the New Testament, you'll find in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus called Daniel a prophet. And that's in verse 15 of Matthew 24. Even in the book of <coughs> Revelation, the apostle John obviously refers to the book of Daniel over and over again. So there's no question about the fact that the book of Daniel is a book of prophecy. But as you read the book, you can't help but notice that there is also within the book historical stories or accounts. I mean, there's more than prophecy here. There's the story of Daniel and his companions who refused to eat the king's meat. Remember that story? There's the story of the three Hebrew children here in chapter 3 who refused to bow to this huge image. There is the story of the writing on the wall that we'll come to. There's the incident of Daniel being cast into the den of lions. Listen, anytime you have historical material, the purpose is usually to simply describe historical events in chronological order. With that said, you could ask if Daniel is a book of prophecy then, which Jesus said it was, then why are these historical stories included in the book? To make that question even more significant is the fact that these historical stories are not in chronological order. I don't know if you noticed that or not. Now that's puzzling, I think. The whole purpose of historical narration is to give us the historical events in chronological order. So anytime historical events are given to us, out of chronological order, then it's obvious that the author is doing something a little different with the historical material than he normally does. So how did the story say of the fiery furnace get into the book of Daniel? If it is indeed a book of prophecy, why did Daniel tell us about the 90-foot image why did he tell us about the three Hebrew children who refused to bow to that image? Why did he include in his book of prophecy the story of them being cast into the fiery furnace and being supernaturally delivered? What has that got to do with prophecy? Some have come to the book of Daniel and they've talked about the fact that these three Hebrew children were thrown into the fiery furnace and in similar fashion, we face furnaces. There are trials and troubles that have found their way into our lives so that we feel like we're in a furnace, a pressure cooker, a trial, a tribulation. And maybe we could even ask, why is there a furnace in our life this morning? Why is there a furnace in our life this morning? Why did God allow the three Hebrew children to be tossed into the furnace? And why does God allow us to be tossed into a fiery furnace? Well, it's that question that we'd like to wrestle with this morning. We only have two very simple points this morning. The first is we'd like to discuss how the story of the fiery furnace got in the book of Daniel. And you said, duh, I can tell you that God put it there. And that would be true. And then we'd like to discuss how your furnace got into your life. 
Because some of us are in a furnace this morning of some kind of trouble or trial in our life. Now bear with me, this may sound just a little off, but it's not off. The more we study and read the book of Daniel, I think you have to come to the conclusion that the story of the fiery furnace was put in the book of Daniel as an illustration of the Jews during the tribulation period. And I've believed that for quite some time. I think this story certainly happened, and it's historical. That's a fact. But at the same time, Daniel put it in his book at this point to be an illustration of something that God is going to do in the future. And listen, this is the view of most uh, premillennialists, those that believe the Lord's going to come before the seven-year tribulation. And he's going to come catch us away, right? And take us home, and that'll be a glorious day. Many Bible teachers agree with this view. For example, in bygone generations, Dad has quite a few books by Dr. Ironside. But Dr. Ironside, who was for many years the pastor of the Moody Church in Chicago, said, what is all this, meaning Daniel chapter 3, have to do with prophecy? Why did God cause this particular bit of history to be recorded in the book of the prophet Daniel? Remember, Christ called him a prophet in Matthew 24. And this has been something very suitable to a historical book, Dr. Moody, Dr. Barnside still speaking, or a devotional book, but why find it in a prophetic book? And then he answers his own question by saying, for a very good reason indeed, this event, though actual history, is a typical scene picturing the trial and the deliverance of a faithful remnant of Daniel's people that is to take place in the time of the end. And I think what we're trying to do is set this up so that we're moving in that direction about the prophecy of what's going to happen in the end time. There's a lot of good preaching here, no doubt. But I think the context would force us into this prophetic meaning here that these images have for us. And that's what I'm trying to get at, right? There will come a day when like the great image set up by Nebuchadnezzar, what the Lord Jesus called the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel, the prophet, <coughs> excuse me, is going to be set up in Jerusalem by the Antichrist of the future. In other words, Dr. Ironside is simply saying that though this actually happened, historically happened, it is put in the book of Daniel as a picture of something that will happen in the future. And you said, well, you, why did you just tell us that? I did. And most of you, perhaps, some of you remember the name W.A. Criswell has said of this, the miracle depicted here is the picture and the prophecy of Israel in the days of great tribulation, when they shall be thrown into the, fire, into the fury of a burning fire and shall not be consumed. Or what about our friend Dr. J. Vernon McGee? That's Joe Mitch's friend. Dr. McGee, every day on the radio, has said this chapter is historic in its content and seemingly is out of place in the account of Daniel and his prophecies. However, it is a picture of the great tribulation. It is a prophetic picture of coming events during the great tribulation. Listen, we're simply suggesting that many Bible believers, Bible teachers, excuse me, and we just mentioned a few, have suggested that the story of the three Hebrews being cast into the fiery furnace was put here as a, prof as a prophetic picture. So what we want to do this morning is take a good look at how this really, how this really, uh, this picture will happen during the tribulation period, all right? And the comparisons, hopefully, are obvious. And I hope I don't lose you along the way. If I do, you can go back and get lost again when you listen to it the second time. For example, Nebuchadnezzar erected an image and demanded that all the leaders bow down and worship that image. Well, in a similar fashion, the Bible teaches in the book of Daniel that we will see later in the book of Revelation as well as other places in the Bible that there will come a time preceding the coming of Christ in which there will be an antichrist and he will be like Nebuchadnezzar. 
<coughs> now let me explain, and so hang with me. Before Nebuchadnezzar came along, Israel ruled in the land of Palestine. But because of their idolatry, God allowed Nebuchadnezzar to come in and conquer them. According to the Lord's statement in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 21, that began the times of the Gentiles so that Nebuchadnezzar was the first world ruler during the times of the Gentiles. You, re you may remember as we looked at Daniel chapter 2 that God gave Nebuchadnezzar a vision of an image starting with the head and going down to the feet and each part or section of that human form was said to be a world kingdom and Nebuchadnezzar was the head of gold. And after him came the Medes and the Persians and the Greeks and the Romans and ultimately the restoration of the Roman Empire. So that Nebuchadnezzar's entrance onto the stage of history actually started the times of the Gentiles. And he was, from God's prophetic point of view, the first world ruler. Now, he did not literally rule every corner of the world, but there's no doubt about the fact from biblical or secular history that Nebuchadnezzar had a world empire that extended all over the then known world. In a similar fashion, the book of Revelation teaches that just prior to the second coming of Christ, there will be an antichrist who will establish a world kingdom and a world power, and a world empire, excuse me. So in Daniel chapter 3, Nebuchadnezzar is a picture of the coming antichrist. The three ch Hebrew children then are a picture of the remnant left in Israel. The study of Jewish remnant is a study all by itself in the Word of God. If you look in the Old Testament, you find that even when Israel degenerated into idolatry, that there was a remnant that worshipped Jehovah. <coughs> Excuse me. As a matter of fact, the three Hebrew children were part of that remnant. Even when the situation got so bad that God allowed Nebuchadnezzar to conquer Jerusalem, there were still Jews within Judea who worshipped God, and they were faithful to him. Daniel and those three Hebrew children were no doubt a part of that group. How else would they have known everything they knew about God? Their parents were teaching them right. I mean, they, they were following the Lord, I believe, holy. Anyways, they were deported, they were hauled off to Babylon, they were rem and yet they, they remained faithful to God. The book of Romans chapter 11 verse 5 indicates that there is a faithful remnant to this day. There are Jews within the Jewish community who are still faithful to God. They recognize that God has sent the Messiah. They have recognized Jesus Christ as the Messiah. That's the remnant today. And that existed in the Old Testament, and that remnant exists today. Well, the indication in the book of Revelation is that that remnant will exist during the time of tribulation period. In fact, look with me to Revelation chapter 7, and look at verse 4, if you will. Revelation chapter 7, or you can just listen, whatever you'd like to do. And verse 4, <coughs> excuse me. <clears throat> and I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed a hundred and forty and four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Now look at verse 14 of Revelation 7, if you would. And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Now I want you to put these two verses together and it becomes obvious that we're talking about the great tribulation, right? It's just right there in the text. Revelation 7, 14 says that. And also obvious that we're dealing with Jews. Verse 4 says, the latter part of the verse, they came from the tribes of the children of Israel. Verse 14 also tells us that they have washed their robes and have made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So here in the midst of the tribulation period is a remnant, a small remnant that has been faithful to the Lord. 
They've trusted in Jesus Christ. Now in Daniel chapter 3, the three Hebrew children are a picture of that remnant that will exist during the tribulation period. Are y'all tracking with me a little bit? All right. The image that Nebuchadnezzar set up and demanded that everyone worship then becomes the picture of the abomination of desolation. And we will talk about that. There's several ideals. No one really knows what it is, but the words are mentioned. And it's going to be horrific, whatever it is, that will happen during the tribulation period. In fact, many have pointed out that it's rather interesting that Nebuchadnezzar begins the time of the Gentiles, and that right at the beginning of the time of the Gentiles is what we have is a forced state religion. What he did had forced the state. Everybody had to bow to this state religion. That's interesting, isn't it? And that's the coming beast system that we're going to see on the rise. It's on the rise today. The state is forcing all the people to worship that image, a man-made image, an idol. That kind of activity has happened periodically down through history. There was the Roman emperor worship. All the Japanese shrines fall into that category. Even statues of linen and all that kind of stuff that have forced state religion. Now the Bible indicates that during that tribulation period, just before Christ comes, there will be just that sort of thing. Jesus in Matthew 24 again talks about the abomination of desolation. Paul in 2 Thessalonians talks about the fact that the Antichrist would go into the temple and declare that he is God. There's a part of that abom uh, abomination of desolation. The book of Revelation gives us a picture of the beast causing them to worship the false prophet, causing the people during the tribulation period to worship the beast. It's all the, the tread that runs through the times of the Gentiles that there is a forced state religion where people are forced to worship the religion that the state picks out. And in the tribulation period, that will be the worship of the Antichrist. This point is really interesting found in Daniel 3.1. At least I think it is. Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height was three score cubits and the breadth thereof six cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Sixty cubits high and six cubits wide. As you know, six is the number of man. And the sixes in the dimension of Nebuchadnezzar's golden image point over to the one whose number is 666. Even the Antichrist, did you notice that, the one, that one of the sixes is missing in Nebuchadnezzar's image? Probably because the rebellious system is not yet fully developed. That's as good as anybody else's idea, right? Six is the number of human incompleteness. Seven of God's completeness. Six days are given for man to work, but the seventh day belongs to God. Even Satan's masterpiece, the Antichrist, cannot measure up to more than three score and six. So Nebuchadnezzar's image was measured 60 by six. So Nebuchadnezzar is a picture of the Antichrist. The three Hebrew children are a picture of the remnant during the tribulation, and the image becomes a symbol of the worship of the Antichrist, the abomination of desolation. Well, there's more. The furnace then becomes the picture of the suffering of the remnant. Look with me again to Matthew 24. Or you can just listen. Matthew 24 is commonly referred to as the Olivet Discourse. And in that passage, the Lord talks about what will happen during the tribulation period. And let me just read you verses 21 through 24. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor even shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake those days shall be shortened. Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there believe it not, for there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. The point is, verse 21 
that there will be such trouble as not, that it's not ever been on the earth prior to this or for that matter after this. It will be a time of great tribulation. It will be a time of exceeding great fiery furnace, right? That's the picture. That's the image. In fact, in Daniel 3, Nebuchadnezzar said, heat up the furnace seven times hotter than normal. I mean, you can take all the destruction and all the devastation down through time and all of the death and all the world wars and wars and put them all together and you'll have only the beginning of the horror of the furnace in the great tribulation period that's going to come about. It is going to be a horrible time. So Daniel chapter 3 produces a picture of even the suffering that will go on in the great tribulation. Then the three Hebrew children were miraculously and supernaturally delivered. And in a similar fashion, God will deliver many within the Jewish remnant during the tribulation period. And in a similar fashion, in Daniel chapter 3, the three Hebrew children were delivered from the fiery furnace. But those that, that, threw, them, that threw them in were consumed. You remember those, those mighty guards that threw them in? They were consumed. Likewise, during the tribulation period, God's judgment will fall and many will be consumed. As a matter of fact, the whole period is a time of God's divine judgment and God's wrath upon the earth. The book of Revelation beginning in chapter 4 and going all the way through chapter 19 gives us the picture of one set of judgments poured out upon the earth. There are three sets of seven judgments that are poured out upon the earth during the tribulation period. There's a lot of stuff going on here in there. You said, man, I didn't realize that all that was in Daniel chapter 3. Well, it's right there, isn't it? That's why you study the Word of God. It, it's there, and God means for us to know it. I think it encourages us. I, I won't be here. I hope none of you will be here. I'm, I'm, on a, I'm an escape artist. I'm leaving. But this world is going to be in for the ride of their life. But there are three sets of seven judgments that are poured out upon the earth during the tribulation period so that the Gentiles will be judged. Those godless people that are ruling the world at that time will be judged by the hand of God. The fact that those who tossed in the Hebrew children were consumed by the fire is a picture of that judgment which is to come. Listen, what we're trying to say is that Nebuchadnezzar is a picture of the Antichrist, just a picture, all right? Because God is not through dealing with Nebuchadnezzar, right? We still got him cast out and becoming a wild beast, and then he, he magnifies and glorifies God. So Nebuchadnezzar's got some things going on in his life. But here in chapter 3, the very image, the picture, is that he is Antichrist. And I think his very actions depict that he's Antichrist. Of the image and all the things that he did is the Antichrist system, right? The three Hebrew children are a picture of the remnant. The image is a picture of the abomination of desolation. The furnace is a picture of the suffering. The deliverance of the three Hebrew children is a picture of God's protection of the remnant during the tribulation. Now, I know there's going to be a lot going on. We, can't, we don't have time to talk about all that this morning. I've got like 29 pages to do this morning. So y'all are going to be here for a while. If you're looking sad now, you're going to really be sad in an hour. But you just think about it. All the things that are going to be going on during the tribulation period. And you've got those that are who are killed and destroyed, and some will be saved. Some, it's, going to be, it's going to be an interesting time. And I look forward to getting to Revelations and talking about these things. I, it's really interesting. All right, and then the destruction of the soldiers and the guards in Daniel 3 is a picture of God's judgment on the Gentiles during the tribulation period. So that you could say in a capsule fashion, you could say is a picture, a photograph, a portrait of what is to come upon this earth just before the second coming of Christ. 
Now, just so you know, I, I mentioned the second coming, and that makes people nervous. Well, what about the rapture? What The rapture is going to happen before the second coming. So don't let that get you all up in a knot. It's like explaining the sovereignty of God. If you don't explain election and foreordination and all that kind of stuff, everybody gets nervous. Well, you're not very sovereign. You know what I mean? So there you go. The Lord's going to come get us, so you don't have to worry. It's going to be good. All right, here we go. But before the second coming of Christ, the rapture has already taken place, and the bride is with Christ. Now, before we go on, we want to stop for just a moment and say one thing. And that one thing is this. Why then did God allow the three Hebrew children to go into the fiery furnace? I think that's a reasonable question in light of everything that we've presented about this being more than just a story. It's a prophetic story. Why did he allow that? Was it to punish them? I, I don't think so because they did what was right according to everything we know. I mean, they honored the Lord fully. I mean, holy. They, I mean, they did what was right. They did nothing wrong. Nothing is mentioned on any sin they committed. Why then did God allow them to go into the fiery furnace? Well, if this interpretation is correct, and I believe it to be, then the answer to that question is this. God needed an illustration. God needed an illustration. God wanted to give us a picture of what he was going to do in the future. He wanted a picture for his prophetic album. You can't figure God out. And so he allowed them to be subjects of that picture so he could place them in the album we call the book of Daniel. Listen, here's the principle. This is what I want you to notice. And notice it carefully, and I want you to try and remember it. God had a purpose beyond them. God had a purpose beyond them. And again, if what I'm saying to you is correct, God had a purpose beyond them for allowing them to go into the furnace. And In fact, I believe that that is true even if you don't accept the prophetic picture we've tried to paint for you this morning. Even if you don't accept the view of prophecy, I think we could conclude that God allowed the three Hebrew children to go into the fiery furnace because he knew he was going to instruct Daniel to write this story down so that it could be for spiritual profit to us and for us. And we have Bible for that, don't we? You know the verse? Because Paul in the New Testament said, everything that happened to them in the Old Testament was for what? Our benefit and our learning. Romans 15, 4. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. So the main thing this far is that God had a purpose beyond them. He wanted to record that story for His Word so that we could learn spiritual truth from it. And maybe even beyond that, He wanted to give us a picture of a prophetic event, still future, even from our point, even from our point of view. Now, that's how Daniel chapter 3 got in the book of Daniel. And you said, man, you went around a long ways to tell us a very simple truth. But I wanted to use the Word of God. What, why do you have the Bible if you don't use the Bible to interwove it with truth, right? That's why it explains itself, right? That's how the story of the fiery furnace got in the Bible. And what we want to do for a moment now is talk about the furnace in your life. The furnace in your life. Make no mistake about it. There will be a furnace in your life. He may come from several different sources, but whatever the source, God will allow furnaces in our lives. The New Testament tells us that God chastens us, right? Hebrews 12 tells us that He scourgeth every son whom He receiveth. You know, scourgeth refers to flogging with a whip, a severe, painful form of beating. And yet that's the word that Paul used 
here in Hebrews chapter 12. That's some pretty powerful language. Listen, that scourging is sometimes to punish and sometimes to perfect. God allows trials to come into your life, my life, to develop us, to perfect us, to do something in us, to do something with us, right? That trial that God allows to come may be a bereavement, the loss of a loved one or a dear friend. It may be a betrayal. Have you ever been betrayed, perhaps by your best friend? Have you ever been betrayed by someone very close to you? That, my friend, is a furnace. That is really a furnace. You feel the heat. God would allow that to happen so that He can develop you. There will be heartaches in your life. I mean, just mark it down. God would allow the heartaches to come. And with along with them, headaches, right? There will be adversity. It's coming. Just get ready for it. In fact, Peter said, Think it not strange the fiery trial which is to try you. 1 Peter 4, 12. Beloved, think it not strange. Man, this is really weird. That's what strange means. It means weird. Man, this is really weird. Why is this happening? This is weird. Concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some weird thing happened unto you. But the deal is with a child of God, this is normal procedure weirdness. Weird things happening. Things that are different happening to you. Why did that happen? What, what, what's going on there? Where'd that come from? Just weird, strange. You ever had strange things happen to you? I ain't talking about the show Stranger Things. That's Colin's favorite show. But there's setbacks, there's suffering. So we just have to get ready for it. It's coming, my friends. And you know this to be true if you've been saved for any length of time at all. Trials are coming. I mean, just like Donna's finger, that's weird. Raynaud's is what, they don't even know what it is. All of her fingers just eating away. The bone stuck through once and it broke off and now it's sticking through again and her flesh just continues to eat away off that finger. That's just weird. They don't even have, a, they don't even have an explanation for it at the, at the doctor. It's just weird. But nonetheless, we're in the middle of it. But this is the way that God trains us, and He allows interruptions, He allows interferences to come into our lives, right? There's setbacks, there's suffering, so we just have to get ready for it. It's coming. And again, you know it to be true. And if that's not enough, Satan will afflict you. He did Job and he tried Jesus, didn't he? Now this source is not God, it's Satan. God will allow it, he has to give him permission, because Satan is the Lord's devil. And he has to get permission for whatever he does, especially when dealing with God's children. I mean, he got permission to afflict Job, and then Satan afflicted Job. The purpose of that was to get him to try and deny the Lord, and God allowed it to happen so he could develop Job. You read Job carefully, his suffering came from every kind of direction. I mean, it was physical, it was social, it was psychological, and it was spiritual. Job had bulls from his head to his foot. The Bible said. Have you ever had a boil? You don't have to raise your hand. Man, those things are painful. You teenagers that think a pimple with a little pus in it's bad. 
You ought to get boils from the top of your head to the bottom of your feet. Can you imagine the pain that that man must have been in? Amidst everything else that was going on in his life. I mean, he was covered with them. But that wasn't bad enough, and all his friends come along and try to give him advice about how ungodly he was. I have people do that kind of stuff sometimes with our situation. They'll say, well, you know, brother, you know, God has his ways and those things to teach us uh, about how to do things. You know, like, I've done something wrong, and that's why God's doing it. Well, it may be, but that ain't your place. Unless God just give you some prophetic word, which I know he didn't because the only prophetic word is in the Bible. He's not speaking any new prophetic words. We just get illumination of what's already been written, right? Listen, if you want to have problems, just get in serious trouble and have your so-called friends give you advice. I mean, Job got the worst of the worst of everything. It was, it was horrible. I mean, so it was physical, and on top of that was the social thing with his friends. He couldn't get any Facebook friends or Twitter friends. No Instagram friends. No one to agree with him. And then if that wasn't enough, his wife comes along and said, Job, why don't you just curse God and die? Job was no doubt thinking right along and then, man, how much more can I take? What's next? I mean, here's what you need is a wife giving you advice like that to curse God. Now, in her defense, in her defense, I think sometimes we're hard on her because I think sometimes if we'll look in our lives when people are suffering around us, how hard it is on us to watch people suffer. You almost feel like it's just as bad as the one suffering. I think she truly loved Job and was so concerned for him, she couldn't stand to watch him suffer any longer. You know, it's one thing to suffer yourself. It's really tough to watch someone you love with all your heart suffer with seemingly no end to the suffering. I can only imagine she herself was depleted in every way. I mean, she had done lost her family and all that they had. It was gone. I mean, she was depleted emotionally and physically and, yes, spiritually. The Bible gives us a few hints of what might have happened to her, but it really doesn't say. But Job suffered more. Not only from the physical suffering, the social suffering, the emotional suffering, but the spiritual suffering. All this pressure on Job, then to top it all, the spiritual pressure. I mean, he had to be thinking, what did I do? I know the Bible said that he never sinned with his mouth, but I bet you his wheels were spinning in his mind. And God told us that for a specific reason, that he never sinned with his mouth. But I bet you in his mind, he had to be, his mind had to be running 100 miles an hour. Thinking, what in the world? His mind had to be in great turmoil. Job really hadn't done anything. But God had a purpose beyond Job. He also had a purpose in the life of Job. He was developing Job. So God will scourge you and he will allow Satan to test you. And on top of all that, the world will come along and they will persecute you. 
Paul says in 2 Timothy 3, 12, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall. It didn't say might. It said shall suffer persecution. As we've mentioned in the book of Daniel, the world does not like you and I serving the Lord. And they'll give you a hard time. But the point is here is the furnace is coming. Why does God allow the furnace in your life? And I'd like to mention two reasons for that this morning. There are more, but let me give you two, right? Two. Number one, to accomplish something in you, God allows the furnace because He wants to do something in you. He wants to develop you. So look back to Daniel chapter 3. We want to make one observation this morning in verse 20 of Daniel chapter 3. And he commanded the most mighty men that were in the army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. Now let's read verse 25. And he answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. In verse 20, the mighty men, they bind them. Verse 25 says they were walking loose and they have no hurt, and the fourth is like the Son of God. I mean, they didn't even have the smell of smoke on them, the Word of God says. Look at what the furnace did for them, what it did for them, is that it burned off what had bound them. Isn't that good? The furnace burns off what binds us. God will allow you to go through the fire so the furnace will burn off what binds you. My friends, we're bound sometimes. We're bound to self, to our own selfishness. We're bound by some sin. Sometimes God allows the furnace to come into your life so that He can break the chain and the shackle of what binds you. He'll break your self-righteousness. I think one of the most serious problems among Christians is their self-righteousness. Their smug self-righteousness. God will allow the furnace so that He can break that chain of self-righteousness. He'll also break the binds of self-confidence when you're trusting yourself and not the Lord. He'll break the chains of self-justification. The furnace comes into your life to do something in you. Just like the blacksmith or the metalsmith who takes gold and puts it in a furnace so that he can purify it. And when he heats it up, the dross comes to the top and they skim it off and they have pure gold or pure metal left. So God allows you to go into the furnace and the fire so that he can perfect you. But there's a second reason why God will allow you to go into the furnace. And that's the point we wish to make this morning in closing. And I cut it short because I think I've said plenty. Why did God put a historical story in a book of prophecy? And as you're reading the Word of God, I think it's interesting to do that. I, I think as we read the Word of God and we, when you're reading Daniel 3 now, this coming week, and you read chapter 3 again, and you read it in that context that it's prophecy, see how more alive it becomes as you read it. I think as we read the Word of God, like in my Father's house or many mansions, if we didn't know what the context was of that, then we just read it in my Father's house. But if we read it in context, knowing that Jesus is comforting and teaching His disciples, then we can say, man, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. He said, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go, I come again, that where I am, there you may be also. He does that so that we're comforted and encouraged. That's why it's important to understand context in the Scripture when you're reading the Word of God so that you understand what you're reading, and it just flows, it goes. And the Holy Spirit will help you, right? Well, 
That's just a tidbit on reading in context, right? But why did God put a historical story in a book of prophecy? The answer is because he had something in mind beyond the three Hebrew children. My friends, perhaps this morning the reason the furnace is in your life and my life is because God wants to do something in you and God has a purpose in mind beyond you. God may allow the furnace to come so that He can do something, something way beyond you. We are so self-centered. We're so selfish. The first time something happens, we want to throw up our hands and say, what did I do to deserve that? Isn't that the way it is? And then if you get the least bit spiritual and learn that God is trying to develop you, and you ask, what is God trying to teach me? And then you say, well, what do I get out of it? Well, one thing, again, God may have in mind is something way beyond you. It might be something you can't even imagine. That may be why He's allowed the furnace to come along. I want you to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Paul talks about some of his suffering, and here's what he says, 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 7. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble, by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. And whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer. Or whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. And our hope of you is steadfast, knowing that as ye are partakers of the sufferings, so shall ye be also of the consolation." You see what Paul is saying in this passage? He's saying that God has allowed trials and troubles, problems, persecutions, sufferings to come into my life so that He could comfort me, so that having comforted me, He could then work through me to comfort somebody else. Now, that's a lot of doings to comfort somebody else, isn't it? I understand you know this. We've heard it preached so many times. But hopefully it's a great reminder. And that's certainly, and that is clearly the point of this passage. Look at verse 4. Who comfort us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble. By the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. And whether we be afflicted, verse 6, it is for your consolation. The word consolation there means comfort and salvation. So Paul says, God has allowed things to go on in my life so that I could comfort somebody else. Because I learned the comfort of God in the furnace of affliction. And here's what I want us to see, and I think it's very important. God allows the furnace because He wants to do something in you, and God allows the furnace because He wants to do something beyond you. Did you hear that? He wants to do something way beyond you. And I really believe that God allowed Satan to test Job so that God would write the book of Job. He said, man, that's a lot to even comprehend. Perhaps you're thinking, well, that's a, that's a little bit too sovereign for me. But look, it's, we've been tracking through Genesis and Joshua. If you don't see God as the Lord supreme, almighty over everything, then we've missed everything. He knows everything. He is in control of everything, and I mean everything. There's nothing that He is not in control of. Well, I've got a whole lot more here, but I think I've said enough today.